Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. American news anchor Tom Brokaw wrote about the veterans of World War II as the greatest generation a couple of years ago. Many people debated the truth in the word greatest, but no one questioned the lumping of people around the same age, living within the same cultural boundaries, experiencing similar events in history into a single entity called a generation. Demographers study population statistics in order to understand structural factors that affect our everyday lives in particular ways. Like our ethnic backgrounds, our gender, our sexual orientation, when we are born affects how we view the world and how we are viewed by the world. When people around the same age experience transitions in life around the same time, demographers refer to this as a birth cohort. When people in a particular birth cohort are conscious about the life changes they are experiencing together, or they begin to be thought of as a group by themselves or others, demographers refer to that experience or thinking as a cohort effect. When members of that birth cohort experience major social trends or historical events together, it is called a period effect. Brokaw asserted that people born between 1910 and 1925, sacrificed and triumphed through World War II from 1939 to 1945, had common experiences, and were of a common good character. Brokaw therefore asserted that a certain age cohort, after experiencing important period effects, became a cohesive group and could safely be thought about as being from a particular group with a particular character. This is, of course, something we do frequently. Bobby Soxers who came of age in the prosperous 50s, baby boomers who came of age in the turbulent 60s and 70s, Generation Xers who came of age in the greedy 80s, Gen Yers who have never known life without a personal computer. Period effects are the stuff that marketing focus groups and best-selling books are made of. But do cohort effects have meaning in our everyday lives? Because some of life's transitions commonly happen around the same age for most people, a certain feeling of cohesiveness occurs when people of the same age meet together and think of themselves as a group. To explore how important it is to be sensitive to these social groupings, we recently visited the Fairfield Activity Center Society at New Horizons in Cook Street Village. 27 years ago, a group of 15 seniors formed a club in the Fairfield area of Victoria in an effort to connect with other seniors and have activities together. Ten years ago, after raising $400,000, mostly from seniors, the group helped purchase the building on Cook Street that also houses three stories of condominiums and a home health care organization. The Fairfield Activity Center holds 26% ownership of the building and relies upon help from the city of Victoria as well as membership fees and fundraising events to continue in its efforts. The organization boasts between 950 and 1,050 members each year, including 10 of the founding members who remain somewhat active. Most of the members come from the Fairfield area, but some of the members live as far away as Duncan and Sydney. The center is open seven days a week, and social, educational, and recreational activities are offered for older adults, including fitness training, weight training, dancing, crafts, computer classes, group dinners, coffee clutches, and afternoon teas. The facilities are also available for renting to other community groups and activities. In short, the facility is an important landmark in Cook Street Village and an important resource in the Fairfield community and the greater Victoria area. We spoke with several members at Fairfield Activity Center and asked them why it was important to have a place specifically available to seniors. Their answer suggested that cohorts feel comfortable with each other and that offering a place that caters to their age group was important for their health and well-being. More than mere labels, people born close to each other find camaraderie with others who are going through the same transitions, such as retirement and the loss of loved ones and friends.
So go ahead and tell me your names again. My name is Charlie Cutler. Bill Sanders. Okay, Charlie and Bill. And uh, how long have you been coming to the center? Uh, I guess I've been going coming to the center for ten and a half years. Wow. For me, it's about five. Okay. Have you lived in Victoria uh, during longer than that, or is that since you've moved yeah. to Victoria? Well, for me, it's since I moved to Victoria. Okay. About eighteen years. So where are you from? From the Niagara Peninsula in Ontario. <coughs> oh, okay. How about you? All over. Uh, uh, Ottawa, Toronto, Vancouver, whatever. Okay. <laughs> Um, what what kind of activities do you uh, come here for? What specifically? I know you guys are here for the coffee meeting. You can tell me about that a little bit if you want. Well, I take place, uh, take part in um, the cribbage. That's about all. Cribbage and this. I come to other um, other functions. Well, we do the dinners too uh, once a month. And I come down here periodically to the entertainments they have here. That's about all. Do you come down daily for this coffee thing, or is that basically, yeah? So this is pretty much how you start your day. Yeah. How about you? Well, my thoughts are the reason I belong to this center is that I feel that my volunteer work can do something that's going to be beneficial to my peers. I don't do it because I enjoy it myself so much as I do the enjoyment I get out of doing it so other people can enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. So along those lines I was a facilitator for our discussion group for about a year, year and a half I guess. I uh, decided it was time to let someone else get the experience. As Bill mentioned we prepare meals. We have a men's group that do the, the cooking complete, complete meal uh, about seven a year. Uh, I call bingo for the uh, bingo groups on uh, Monday, Monday afternoons. Um, and of course, I one of the members of the Coffee Clatch. Mm -hmm. The Senate. A founding member. <laughs> 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 well, I get involved in darts. Uh, I like to shoot darts uh, because my wife enjoys it, and uh, quite often they need someone that can keep the score. And uh, I get involved that way. So, how many hours a week do you think you guys hang out here? Mm. Oh. Two. What, two hours a week? No, too many. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I guess I'm down here all probably ten, ten hours a week. Six. Maybe a, it's a little less now. I am um, I used to be on the executive. I was on the executive for when we started the center here and this is building here. Well, I enjoy it. Well, I enjoy the coffee club particularly. I like Charlie. I've been in other things. I called Bingo for a while and I... I was on the discussion I was on the discussion group with Betty for a while, but uh, I don't know. You just move on. And you you mentioned something interesting. You're talking about calling bingo and that kind of thing. So, for you, for the, it's not just meaningful because it's a place to go, but it's also meaningful because it gives you an opportunity for service. Oh, certainly. And I think that's what all volunteers feel in their hearts, really. Am I doing this because I want to do it, and am I getting the enjoyment out of it, and we don't really care about anybody else? Volunteers don't think that way. Am I doing something that someone else is going to benefit from, then I'm going to do it. And that's the way volunteers think. What is special about a senior center being a place for seniors to volunteer? Do you understand what I mean? I think it's should turn it around. No, it's, it's, it's a very vital item for the seniors themselves, but a lot of the people that, that I'm aware of here uh, contribute here be to give something back. Mm -hmm. They feel they're able to, and so you do it. Um, I don't. Uh, uh, you said you. Uh, I forget just what your words were, but uh, my my thinking about uh, why I do things around here is because I think they need to be done. Hmm. Fortunately, we're, we're still able uh, to uh, to do it, and it helps the whole group. And I think that's the main motivation. What do you think are the advantages of having a community center as opposed to just a general, a, a seniors community center, as opposed to just the, the regular community centers that are open to all ages? Why have a special place for seniors? So I think seniors have different interests than younger people, and you have to cater to their interests. Uh, that's basically, that's my, my thinking. I would say, why do you have so many different departments in the university rather than just one university where you go to learn? There you go. <laughs> yeah. I suppose, and certainly as you age, 
um, you uh, you feel more comfortable with people your own age. There is an uncomfortable feeling sometimes being being with people who are working or uh, so. I, I think it's uh, it's you naturally uh, associate with those you have something in common with. So would it be fair to say this is kind of a haven then, a place not so much an exclusive club, but just a place where you can find peers, where you can uh, kind of get away and be around people that have the same interests? I think it's, uh, I think it's different. I think that uh, the senior center is different things to different people. There are people here to whom this is a haven. This is their chance to, to get out. They're alone. They're there. They get out. They, they do something to actually just be with people. Uh, others, uh, and particularly, I don't our, our, my case, and I think Charlie's too, we have other interests where we're both married. And so, therefore, we still have a, a, a family connection in that mm -hmm. sense there. I suppose part of it is the fact that, uh, and I don't think that's relevant maybe, but uh, we, are, we are in different climates in which we work and live and live for almost so much of our life. Well, thank you. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Any... No. statement you want to make? Yeah, I just, I'd like to make one, one little statement. Everyone keep in mind that the seniors are perhaps the most important people in the community. Everyone is saying, you know, the children, the young people, they're, they're the new generation and they're the ones that deserve all of the attention and all of the goodies and all of the perks because they're going to form the country in the future. But keep in mind that this country was formed by the seniors and we are what we are today because of the seniors. So they're pretty important people. Don't wipe them out. Keep them in mind. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm Jack. Jack Humble. Yeah. Get you and Billy. Okay. I'm Christine Caithness. Okay, Jack and Christine. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been coming to uh, to the Fairfield Center? Well, ever since this one was built. We weren't the founding members, but we were members then because they held it in the United Church. Okay. That was one place. There. So that's about 10, 11 years ago? This will be our 11th year okay. here. You two, you came together? No, my involvement's been a lot longer than that. Okay. Because I was a social worker for this area, and I started the research for the setting up of the senior center. Oh, wow. Way back in 1973. Goodness. Yeah. You had to have not been a senior in 73. No, I was working as a, as a social worker. Okay. And my office was along in Fairfield Plaza. Okay. And uh, I started the two young ladies to do a, a search of all of the, or go and talk to all of the seniors that they could get into and to try and establish the needs of seniors. And then from that office, the New Horizons grant came up at that time. Mm -hmm. And from that office, we started the, the ball rolling to get this season set up. So when you were setting that up back then, were you doing it so that you knew you'd have a place to come later in life? Oh, it's always welcome, of course. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Shirley was the, uh, the director. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she didn't, wasn't the executive director. She was the director of, of the activities and that sort of thing. Have, have you been in Victoria for a long time then? You've lived here quite I a few years? I came back to Victoria. I was in the Navy. And oh. I came back to Victoria in 1970. Okay. So you've been in Victoria since 1970. Mm -hmm. And how about you? How long have you lived in Victoria? I immigrated here 30 years ago. Wow. From where? England? England and the West Indies. Oh. Okay. And you've and you immigrated directly to Victoria. You've been here yes. all that time. So, um, what kind of activities do you come to when you come here? What is what's the kind of things that you do while you're here? Well, Jack and I, mostly Jack, uh, we run the sing along group here. Oh, okay. Uh, with a membership of about between fifty and sixty singers, I run the projector, take the money, enter the names and then run the projector. That's the words on the screen. And Jack does the conducting. We both write out all the songs before they're put on the screen. And that's what we were doing this morning. Do you either of you play music or do you have like uh, pre-recorded music that you play with it? We have a pianist. 
a uh, very fine pianist who comes and plays for us. Okay. And she, uh, she's one of our group too. There are four of us actually that are involved in the setting the thing up. How often does this happen? Every week. Every oh, wow. So it takes us a week to set up the next week. But we have a, a library at the moment of uh, about 1,200 songs. Wow. So are you guys pretty good singers? Everybody sings along really Jack well? Jack has a lovely voice. I'm one of the lead singers, and we have three or four other lead singers. We put on uh, shows. You know, like the last one we did was the Songs of the Big Bands. Oh, wow. And then we did one before that, The Best of Broadway, The Best of Broadway, Songs from All the Broadway Shows. And when you put the shows on, do people from the community come, or is it just for other people well, in the center? Well, it's generally just for ourselves, because oh, we, okay. we, we can't do any for profit in that regard, you know, it is. Mm -hmm. We're using music, and you have to be very careful about it, so use, as you're probably aware. Yes. So, got to give those royalty payments if yes. you're not careful. Yes, so we, we do it, it's a non-profit thing, we do it to amuse ourselves. Okay. But we, we have about uh, 75 or 80 people there. Wow. So. That's nice. They, about that many every week, or they rotate around? Oh, no, we, we, have, a, we have about, as Chris said, between 50 and 60 okay. every week. So. They're very faithful, they come up with that. Wow. How do you think having the Senior Center affects your life? Does it make it better or worse? Give you, how would Much you, better. In what ways? The friendship, the mixing with people, um, sharing our sorrows when they come, um, sharing many things together. We're very good friends, particularly our group, very good friends. Were some of the people that you're friends with here, were you friends with before you came and you came because they were here, or have you made mostly friends after coming here? Well, I made those friends after coming here. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have passed on since My situation is just a little different there. I'm a member of Fairfield United Church, mm -hmm. and a lot of the members of this uh, center belong to that church, so I've known them for years. That's the one on the corner of Moss in Fairfield? Yeah, five points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I agree with Chris in, in that regard, um, I think that this is a, an integral part of my life. and I. I spend time down here. I was down this weekend. I'm down again working on, and it's an opportunity to meet people and talk to people, share all sorts of things, problems, and health problems. And I, I don't think I would ever be a shut-in, but um, it gets one out. And mm -hmm. They can come down and, and meet other people and intermingle. I think it keeps the brain going. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. Do you both live close enough that you can walk here? We could if our legs would let us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack has knee, a knee problem and I have a circulation problem. Do you park here or do you? Yes. You we park right in the mud. Uh, we, yeah. we pay for annual parking here, but we uh, it, it, all that does give you a sticker for the car. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, you'll get in. <laughs> we only have 12 spots for yeah. all the membership. And what advantages do you think it is to to the community to have a separate senior center? I mean, why have a separate senior center? What are the advantages and disadvantages of having one? The disadvantages or the... Yeah, advantage? either way, advantages well, and disadvantages. I think that seniors talk better with seniors. I think they can discuss. They all seem to have the same sort of problems overall, either financial or health or whatever sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it gives an opportunity to talk, but it doesn't cut us off from the community. I worked for 46 years in scouting as well, and I, I, I'm very 
um, very much aware of the younger population, and I, I think I intermingle with them very well too. But um, I think what I enjoy is being able to talk in in my ear with the people present, and I think that's a great asset to the seniors. As far as the the others are concerned in this area, the uh, the do not belong here, um, i.e. they're not members, that's what mm -hmm. I mean. Um, we do put things on that they come to, you know, and, and I think that we do serve a, a very important um, responsibility in this area. I, I know that the facilities are also used by non-members at times, too, yeah, oh yes. which is a nice, so the, just having the building and the, um, mm -hmm. the facilities here is an asset. Yeah. Um, I mean, nobody slams the door when somebody comes in without a card sure. in their hand. And on the contrary, we and also we've been uh, very useful here. Little things that have happened in the village. Uh, someone collapses outside here. You know, the, we, we we can help them here too. And mm -hmm. Judith is hardly qualified, and, and several of us have got industrial first aid and things. Like that. Mm -hmm. And. Having taken the many thousands of kids out in my time, I, I've done a lot of first aid too. <laughs> I guess with scouting that makes sense, yes. Well, any, anything you want to add about the center? Any other um, thoughts about it or anything you want to say now that you got a chance on forum here? My life would be empty without it. It really would. Meeting people even just this morning when there's hardly anybody there, you can always find one person to sit down and talk to. And that person is happy that you did. And we have brought a lot of new people in here. For instance, now Somerset House, as you probably know, is now on the Dallas Road. Mm -hmm. And through going on a bus tour, we have encouraged many of those to join. We haven't seen them yet, but they I think one has joined. Yeah, the wind until the chief and we comes also in at the do end of um, take our music down to Shottings at St. Francis by the Sea. Mm -hmm. We go down there and play there, our group. And sing. And sing. And uh, in that way, we're doing our bit, I hope. Yeah. We belong to a m the music group here, too. So, mm -hmm. so we go down to the music group one time down to St. Francis. They only have 12. And we take about five or six and go down and do a single on board. I look at this place, uh, this was my dream. This is what I started off to do in 1973. And so, you know, I, I'm really, I feel as though that I was the instigator uh, of this and I feel as though it is fulfilling exactly what I wanted. Because I've always had the, a dream of having a center that would be totally senior oriented for that reason, that they could talk in the same level, in the mm -hmm. same language, and talk about World War II if they want to, you know, which wouldn't be very popular in Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I definitely appreciate this. Well, my name is Mickey Hansen. I'm a director here, and... I'm Gordon Cunningham, and I was on the board of directors, and no, I just come down here to have a good time and work. How long have you been coming to the center? When did you start coming down here, and has it been continuous attendance? Or I started in 1978 when it was at the school over at Moss and uh, Fairfield Grove. I came down um, mostly in those days, and um, then I had to work, and I was away for a few years, but I came back when it opened. Well, I'm not sure of the year, but it was uh, when the uh, center was at the uh, United Church in the basement. And we were only <coughs> out here in the wintertime for about four months a year. We joined. We thought it would be a place to play bridge. We never got there, but we stayed members. Then this uh, present uh, premises went up, and uh, we were then here full time. We just continued to be members all along. Now we do participate. At least we come here all the time. I hesitated when I said participate because Joyce and I uh, don't really take much in the way of uh, the activities, but we come here to 
contributing work, as Mickey says. Joyce is president, and, uh, and uh, I work in the kitchen. Mickey works in the kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's giving to the community, to, to the community in which we live. Gordon and I don't work on, we did work on food uh, for some time, and then Gordon and the men have a, a monthly food, and I and my late husband and another lady, Audrey Sethi, we do meals twice a week, twice a month, sorry, um, and we feed about 40 to 45 people, and I think Gordon feeds a little more. How does coming here affect your life? Oh, very much so. Uh, I've been retired close to 25 years, and we tried other centers for retirement. We uh, didn't stumble on Victoria. Joyce's mother and father lived out here, and we were Western Canadians originally. So we came out here, and we discovered that where other communities may didn't have a heart, they had a golf course. Well, we found that Victoria was a community with a heart. <laughs> and with the uh, volunteer work that we do, as Mickey mentioned, Sand Isle, and the center here, we swim at Oak Bay and what have you, there's not, we can't go anywhere in Victoria that we don't see somebody we know. And you know, that just is so darn wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a little story, and that might be a little bit weepy. Um, my husband just died, and the people here were so so caring, you know, you couldn't ask, they wouldn't say too much to me, but they would just come up to me and say, give me a hug. And that's the way they are here. They really care about the other people in the center. Sorry. <laughs> okay. The amount of people that have phoned and sent cards and donations, that's been wonderful. Were you and your husband, your husband was a member here as long as you were? Yes, for many years he did the garden, and then um, they have a gardener do it now. And then he, he and I made sandwiches on Tuesdays, and we did the meal twice a month. So he was very involved, too. What are the advantages of having a community center designated specifically for use by seniors? Well, go ahead, go ahead. I actually think that if uh, somebody would invest the money in a proper center, it would be a good thing for the community. But uh, you must remember that uh, uh, most of our uh, members are, uh, live in uh, rooms, apartments. They're solitary. They need a place to come at all hours of, well, all the hours of the day that they're open. They don't like to come out in the dark. We've tried that. <laughs> and they like to stay home when it gets dark, I don't blame them. Uh, but if you had a facility where the uh, properties that belong to each group could be secured and kept that way, it, they probably could make it work. But until that can be worked out, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, just uh, mathematics and uh, physical design. It, we're, we're comfortable with our own group. We know that all the things that we use, we put them away. They're going to be where we put them. <laughs> that sort of thing. And that, that's, I think, the, uh, the big thing that we consider. Um, I have joined uh, community centers where different age groups have come. And I find that the seniors uh, group seems to be left out of it. It's mostly young families with children and that, and um, it wasn't really a community, it was individual sort of thing. So I find that here at this center, we are all one of an age practically, and uh, I find that wonderful camaraderie between the people here. If there's anything else you'd like to say, now's your big opportunity. Uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Gordon. <laughs> well, as I told you before, we don't, uh, Joyce and I, really don't take part in the activities outside of the, uh, a bridge, if there's a crib tournament or a bridge tournament, we, we get into that. But it's coming down here and helping. And it's getting to know the people. And 
really, as you go through life, you realize that the more you give, the more you get. And I think that we're very blessed because, as I told you, there isn't anywhere in Victoria we go that somebody doesn't say, hi, Gordon, hi, Joyce. And by golly, belonging to a community is what you really, it's all about, you know. I think the staff make this center. There, uh, we've had different changes, but Judith has been here since it's opened, and Debbie, I think, a short time after. They are really efficient people, and they're what make this run in in a way. They keep everything going, and um, I know there's always a little conflict, you know, that'll happen anywhere. But I coordinate the bridge, and we have 14 tables every Tuesday, and um, I try to calm the high-tempered ones down, you know, but <laughs> that's difficult to do sometimes, but we, mostly the people here get along very well with each other. If anybody's sick, people phone up and see how they are, and do you need anything? I'll tell you a little story. A couple of weeks ago, I had a very bad cold, and as you can hear, I still have a bit of it. And a lady in the bridge come, phoned me up, and she said, Mickey, do you need any um, antibiotics picked up at the drugstore? And I said, no, I haven't got any antibiotics. She said, well, if your doctor phones and says, pick some up where London Drug, it's close to me, and I will bring them over to you. That lady just had her 96th birthday. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And, you know, uh, that's the kind of caring I'm talking about. All right. Well, thanks a lot for turning. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the Internet, cfuv.uvig.ca Giving sociology an edge! Thank you.
So, are you old enough to remember Generation Gap? I'm just barely old enough, yes. That was a big word when I was a kid. Generation or Gap? Generation Gap. Oh. I guess that's two words. I heard about it quite a bit for a few years and then it seemed to just go away. Well, I remember hearing about it for most of my childhood in the 60s. And it was a really big deal. It was nobody over 30 years old could understand anybody under 30 years old. And it was as if nobody wanted to live past the age of 30. I actually pulled up the demographics, the U.S. population statistics, I should say, not Canadian but U.S., to find out exactly when the baby boom had occurred by quantitative measures. And it was a one-year phenomenon. It was 1946 only. And I measured it by looking at the percent increase and how it had varied from year to year. And I think the reason, based on what I saw on my casual examination of the data, I think the reason that people thought there was a baby boom was that there had in fact been a huge baby bust in the 30s in that country. Oh, that's interesting. So there's a historical context. Uh, you could call it that. But for some reason, when we say baby boomers, we don't mean just people born in 1946. Oh yeah, that's an interesting thing. That's a big debate. There are early baby boomers and late baby boomers, of which I, you and I are actually, no, you're just one year out of the so-called late baby boomers, aren't you? I think it goes to 64. I wasn't at the last meeting, I'm not sure. <laughs> you say last meeting, but there is an official website on this that actually gets into the uh, specifics on who is and who is not a baby boomer. It's an interesting group of people who are concerned with what I would think is, um, well, sort of frivolous discussions. Though I guess marketers don't think of it as frivolous. They really do try to identify who those people are. If they're doing it quantitatively, I wonder if their results are much better than mine and if, in fact, all the results are not method dependent because births are continuous. There wasn't a really sharp drop in continuity. It wasn't like there were no people born for three or four years and then more people started being born. There are some people variations. People continue to have sex all along. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> it would be hard to I'm rule so, out the possibility. I'm so shocked. So if it's not being done on, dare I use this word, an objective basis. How does one find oneself in a cohort? Well, a cohort, it, it's really important to distinguish between the idea of age structure, that is people are certain ages and the population has X number of people in one age group versus Y number of people in a different age group. That's, that's one way of looking at a population, but it's not a very informative way in terms of understanding people's everyday lives. Another way to look at populations is, is the effect of the cohort. So we can, we can say that you are in one cohort or another based upon your birthday, but it's more accurate to say that you are in one cohort or another based upon who you identify with. Basically the idea is that people go through the same kind of life experiences pretty much in a, in a particular order within a culture. It's always contextualized by the expectations of culture. And because we all go through these particular life milestones around the same time, 
we tend to hang out with and identify other people who are going through these major milestones. So you have the newlyweds and the nearly dead talked about in Victoria a lot as a description of the population. And what that's referring to is two major life milestones. One is being a young adult, being ready to get married and start a uh, family. And the other is the milestone of being retired and facing different life changes, such as the fact that you begin to lose more and more loved ones, more and more friends, your peers are passing away, that kind of thing. And also you have more free time. Uh, you don't have as uh, strong a connection to work life as you once did, those kind of things. So those are major milestones in a life, and cohort effects are built around those milestones. When that culture begins to change, which it has in the last 30 or 40 years, those milestones are, are a little mixed up right now. So it's a little harder to say that somebody in their 20s or somebody in their 30s is in a particular cohort right now because they are experiencing life a little bit differently than their parents did. For instance, I just read an article yesterday that said that people are marrying much later in life. Uh, Canadians, the average Canadian man doesn't marry until he's 29 years old, and the average Canadian woman doesn't marry until she's 27. That's much later than their parents got married. And a lot of people are choosing not to marry at all, and that's a milestone that was once an uh, important milestone in Western culture that is becoming less and less in a milestone all the time. I used the term method dependency earlier. I'm now going to use it three more times. Method dependency, method dependency, method dependency. Yes. Or is there something I'm missing? No, you're not missing anything at all. But, well, yes, you are missing something. You're looking at it from the demo demographer's viewpoint. Yes, from the demographer's viewpoint, it's method dependency. But people still experience cohort effects. They still look around and they say, gee, I'd like to talk to somebody my own age. And they don't necessarily mean somebody born on the same day as them. What they mean when they say that is, I'd like to talk to somebody who's going through the same kinds of experiences that I am going through. So when people at the senior center talk about how much easier it is to be someplace with people their own age, they don't necessarily mean everybody over 65 gets along with them. What they do mean is that they've got more in common with people who are retired, people who are not working, people who want to do volunteer work, et cetera, et cetera. So they're really talking about life experiences, not numbers. So they're talking about shared values, not in the family values sense of the word values, but in the cultural sense of yes. that word. Yes. And that can be an important source of meaning for our lives. I mean, it's a way of finding camaraderie. It's a way of understanding new experiences. You talk to other people who are going through those experiences. You connect with them in a way that helps you make sense out of your life. That's a very important resource for people all the way through their lives. And I think that's why it is important to have spaces and culture where people can find each other who are of similar ages going through similar milestones. And the fact that somebody who's 55 and is just retired and is going through the same kinds of things that somebody else might not go through until they're 75 is irrelevant. They can still relate to each other in, in a lot of ways. Now, the question is, why do we talk about baby boomers and the greatest generation and and uh, Bobby Soxers and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's a whole other effect. That's connecting age to history and specifically to major historical events. I'm sure that in the next 10 years, you're going to start hearing people talk about the post-September 11th generation and how that affected young people who were coming of age. And it's interesting because we usually get marked in a category based upon when we come of age. Like the baby boomers are marked by the turbulent 60s when they were all turning 18. The Generation Xers are marked by the greedy 80s, by the decade where uh, conservatism raised its head again and people were thinking more about the bottom line and so forth. 
your generation gets marked by when you actually are becoming an adult. Nobody talks about the people in World War II who were in their 60s and dealing with World War II. They talk about the people in World War II who were in their 20s and dealing with World War II. That's the World War II generation. Is that simply because formative experiences are presumed to occur earlier in life? To be blunt about it, it may be of some social concern if a teenager is scarred for life, but I think the damage would be, by consensus, less threatening if a 75-year-old were scarred for life. <laughs> well, possibly. That's one way to look at it. Like, it's, it's, it's more of a crisis if it happens to you when you're younger because you have a longer life to go to deal with it than when you're older. I suspect that some of this is has got to do with consumerism, with a desire in our particular culture, in North American culture, to care about who has the money. The grain of America, which is a big discussion in aging circles, in sociology of aging, and in gerontological circles, is in part being forced to the forefront because there is now an understanding that older people have more resources. It used to be that young families and uh, middle-aged people were considered the people with the money, and by virtue of that, they're teenage children. And so marketers paid attention more to younger generations. So I suspect that there's an economic element as to why we pay attention to the 20-somethings. And on a related note, I'm having trouble determining who does have the money, but that's because I rely on self-reporting to such a great and naive extent. The extras claim that they never got a break. The seniors claim that they're being left out in the cold. And the boomers claim that they never really had access to it, and they don't know where it all went. Maybe there's no money. Yes, that must be it. Everybody thinks the other person has it. That's it. Money is defined subjectively only and thus has no ontological grounding. Ah, the problem is solved. Why am I not relieved? <laughs> well, that could be another topic for another show. <laughs> but I, I think that the thing that is important to, to distinguish here and gets confused a lot in popular rhetoric is the difference between period effects and cohort effects to use the sociological or demographic language about it. A cohort effect is about life changes. It's about connecting with people in your everyday life who are going through the same things that you're going through. But we tend to confuse that with going through major events, with historical events. But the fact is that all generations that are alive, everybody who's alive when a major historical event happens, is affected by that event. And the fact is that cohorts are usually made up of people of varying ages because people make life choices differently. Some people have no children and never have a family per se. Uh, some people uh, don't marry. They spend their lives single. Uh, some people come to their careers very late in life or others start their careers in their teenage years. So there's a lot of variation, and a lot of people that get put into one group actually experience life and connect better with a different age cohort. That has a lot of implications. You're talking about methodology, methodology, methodology. This has a lot of implications for research that's done from general social surveys, which tend to lump everybody together on the basis of their birthday. That's a big jump. It's a big assumption to decide that because somebody was born between 1945 and 1964, they have stuff in common. They may not be experiencing that at all, especially the ones that were born later than 1955 as opposed to those who were born before 1955. Well, all methods of social grouping are presumptuous. It's just a question of how much so. And in fact, the issue of how presumptuous each method is draws a lot of attention in sociological circles in and of itself. Is race the factor? Is class the factor? If we're going to reduce it to a one variable model, what would the factor be? If we're not, 
how would we handle it? Yes, which is, of course, being a qualitative researcher, my, well, I would say what you need then is qualitative research. You need to go and talk to people and ask them what is meaningful to them. You need to do it in depth. You cannot just make assumptions because they fit in a category or even because they identify with a category. You know, the, you check a box on a, on a sheet of paper that doesn't necessarily mean that's an important category in your life. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. Music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural, or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com. I'm just kidding. The, uh, I'm interested why you're at MBA. Mm -hmm. Why you're in the next profession. It's like joining the French Foreign Legion. You get a little drunk, you think, hey, let's do something original and inventive. And once it wears off, once you're sober again, you begin thinking, this wasn't such a hot idea after all. <laughs> but by that time, it's too late too to late. back out. Yeah. Well, well, uh, well, well, 
<laughs> well, uh, I'm a commerce student, so uh, I just wondered when I when I read your card why uh, an MBA would be mixed up in this, but uh, there's enough to read. Organizational matters, media matters, media criticism, that sort of yeah. thing. It's all up. Uh, it's all open season for an MBA. Yeah, now it is. Uh, we spent open. most of our time in B school yeah. reading texts and commenting on them. Those texts were not novels or fiction or anything like that. They were, quote, case studies, close quote. But the yeah. principles of dissection are the same in each case. Well, it, I, I, it's interesting. The MBA struck me as being uh, a little... A non sequitur. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, well, Patty uh, likes to call this a sociology show, but when someone asks me about it directly, I say that it's about organizational matters. Yeah. Which, you know, there's a big overlap. Big overlap. Big overlap. Big overlap. Big overlap.